The Tom Woods Show, episode 925. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're listening to this on the way to work and you're bleary-eyed from a rotten night's sleep, maybe it's time for a Casper mattress. Get $50 toward your Casper mattress by going to casper.com slash woods and entering promo code woods at checkout. Hello, everybody. Tom Woods here. Brad Berzer's back with us once again. We're going to talk science fiction and liberty because he has the second in a series of courses on that very subject just out at libertyclassroom.com. That's course number 19 for us in all kinds of areas, uh, U.S. history, European history, logic, uh, political thought, economics, economic thought, all kinds of courses we have for you at libertyclassroom.com. So if you have not checked that out yet, you're definitely going to want to do that. And the fact that Brad Berzer is on our faculty is one of the great selling points of that whole product. Brad, of course, is a professor at Hillsdale College. He's the author of several books, including Russell Kirk, American Conservative, which is the winner of the Paolucci Book Award last year. He's a great guy all around, and he has excellent taste in music. I say that because his taste in, in music and mine, uh, they're pretty much identical. So, Brad, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Tom. I'm always happy to talk to you. Much appreciated. Everybody loves this topic. I mean, libertarians and science fiction. You know, come on. <laughs> this is, this is uh, if this ain't fish in a barrel, I don't know what is. It was definitely definitely a dream course, and I had a great time doing it. Yeah, very much so. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it because we're enjoying the content. And I got uh, McClanahan working on another course for us. I got to get more econ. I got uh, Murphy's doing his next uh, history of economic thought course. Everything is just great. falling into glorious place over at libertyclassroom.com. But anyway, well, last time we had John talk about science fiction, we had people saying, well, why didn't he talk about this one and that one and whatever? It's because they didn't realize that this is a series of courses. You hadn't even gotten chronologically to those why haven't why hasn't he talked about. So in particular, you spend a good amount of time in this course on one of my all-time favorites. I, I wouldn't describe myself as a science fiction fan, right. really, but I am definitely a Ray Bradbury fan. Nice. <laughs> and I remember you and I were talking on uh, Facebook about Chronicles magazine and how fond we were of it. We used to read it in the 90s. And I remember seeing an article by Ray Bradbury in Chronicles thinking, these are two glorious worlds coming together. And yeah. so can you maybe start with that, not even with his his work, but with the fact that he could, how could Ray Bradbury wind up in a magazine like Chronicles? Where is he coming from philosophically? Well, you know, that's a great question, Tom. And he, as a young man, he never went to college. In fact, he was not a fan of college. And he believed the best thing to do after high school was to educate yourself. But he had being just, a, I think, a master of the word, even as a very, very young man, he had really devoured, for example, Albert J. Nock. He loved Nock. He loved Nock's writings. He loved Nock's ideas. You know, he read everything he could. I don't know for certain that he read people like Rose Wilder Lane and Isabel Patterson, but frankly, I'd be pretty shocked if he didn't, especially given his own love of Albert J. Nock. He also liked Mencken, so you know, he was very much, as a young man, he believed very strongly in a kind of, I, I would call it an American libertarianism. There's almost a, a naivete and also kind of a glorious, just anything can happen in America with liberty kind of feeling. Uh, he, as he got older, he was not always consistent. I don't think he ever really tried to be consistent in his own political thoughts. But I would say that 90 to 95 percent of the time, he would have fit in perfectly with what you're talking about, what Tom Wood stands for, what Liberty Classroom stands for, what this podcast stands for. That's that's just really who he was. He did not like being interfered with. He was not a friend of authority. So you know, a lot of people that he not only read but liked, he was very close friends with Russell Kirk, for example, uh, they just, it, it meshed. For him, life was about doing the right thing. It was about being creative. And you know, why would you ever allow 
allow any institution to mess with that. So he had an almost instinctive libertarianism in everything that he did. So in Chronicles, and I, I remember that article very well, Tom. I know I'm a little bit older than you, but when I was at Indiana getting my working on my graduate degree, the business library there had Chronicles. And of course, it came out monthly. And one of my great treats was to go over Friday afternoons and give myself a break. And I would read Liberty and I would read the new issue of Chronicles and whatever NR was out that week. So I, I remember very well coming across that article by Ray Bradbury and just being thrilled about that. Well, he was apparently quite a foe of political correctness, which is a fun thing to learn about. I didn't know about his friendship with Russell Kirk. I do want to talk about Russell Kirk because I think a lot of people, if they have heard of him, they don't know about his fiction and his ghost stories and sure. stuff like that. So uh, let's get to that later. All right. Yeah. I consumed a lot of Ray Bradbury's short stories when I was growing up. Now, of course, I read Fahrenheit 451. I read The Martian Chronicles, and those were great. But I always felt that his the short story was the genre where his genius really came through. Now, in the but in the the longer books in Fahrenheit 451, it's easier to glean, let's say, libertarian themes. But was I missing them in the short stories? I was only eleven. No, you weren't missing them. Uh, there are probably some subtle things there. I think most of his libertarianism really came out more in an expression of individualism than it did in, say, actual anti-government sentiment. Though you can feel that very strongly, of course, in Fahrenheit 451 and Martian Chronicles. But Tom, I think that's an incredibly astute observation about Bradbury, because even his novels were just compilations of his short stories. So that was really what he was good at. Uh, you know, the very fact it's called the Martian Chronicles. It was just a fancy way of saying I put a bunch of my short stories that's together. That's right. That's that's right, but, yeah. but Fahrenheit 451, that definitely is a full, full-blown full novel. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, probably in today's market, it would be a novella because it's not quite a novel. But yeah, I agree. And even that, though, started from a short story he wrote called The Fireman. And it was an attempt to wonder what would happen if Joseph McCarthy, and not just McCarthy, it wasn't that personal, but if the whole movement towards uh, some radicalisms in America, if we would essentially become communist in fighting communism, that was a great worry of Bradbury. And he, he was, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how much you know about this, Tom, and I don't want to repeat anything that your audience would know, but the FBI opened a file on Bradbury in the early 1950s, and there had been rumors that he was a communist and it's amazing because you can go back and now you know, the FBI, I don't know if they had to do this or they do this because they want. You can go into the FBI archives online and read some of their old reports on people. But their complaint about Ray Bradbury was that he loved the Fifth Amendment and therefore he must be a communist. Oh, no, no, that's <laughs> terrible. Wow. Yeah. So I guess that means Madison was a communist. And <laughs> that's a Let's hope that was just some idiot FBI agent, but I, I'm afraid it might have it might be a little more serious than that. But anyway, yeah, that was the evidence against Bradbury. There's a line in Fahrenheit 451 where uh, there's an English professor speaking who says that the firemen who were there, of course, not to put out fires, but to set fires to burn books, and the this English professor says that the firemen aren't so necessary these days and the quotation is so few want to be rebels anymore so uh, you don't even need them anymore yeah. that man that's just devastating and that just sums up bradbury you know bradbury and and the guy is interesting too because as much of a rebel as he was he never ever became a cynic he always had this optimism that in the long run, individualism, liberty, and creativity would win, that we would always be, you know, now, granted, we may have momentary defeats, but in the long run, we would win simply because the, the people who try and restrict us have no imagination, and therefore, they only have a certain set of things they can do, and then they're done. And we, with imagination, according to Bradbury, we will win in the long run. I've read a bunch of collections of his short stories. And in fact, I, I have a, a volume that I think may be his collected 
short stories, at least for a certain period. Right. But I remember being in the sixth grade, and they gave us a list of books, and you had to read X number of them and take a quiz on them, and you could pick whichever ones you wanted. So, of course, when you're in sixth grade, what are your friends doing with the list of books? They're trying to find what is the shortest book on the <laughs> list, then what's the second shortest. So anyway, with me, so of course those books, the shortest were already taken out of the library. So one day just, at random, I picked out The Illustrated Man by Ray Bradbury, yes. which always remained my favorite collection of his stories. And I became a proselytizer for this book. Yes. I said to everybody, look, I know it's longer than these other stupid books, right. but you're going to love it. And I got a couple of them to believe me long enough to do it. And they came back and said, whoa, I actually liked this book. I thought, yeah, I know. Let's you know, keep it on the down low here. You know, we, yeah. you know you said, cool cool people don't let, look, not like I ever tried to pretend to be a cool person, but <laughs> right. but oh, you still God. don't want to go around saying, I loved this book. I was assigned for school. But anyway, if somebody wants a good, easy entry point into Ray Bradbury and the brilliance of his short stories, I would highly recommend The Illustrated Man. Oh, and just you think about, and I think I was probably your age as well, Tom, when I first read it, but that opening where you're staying with this hobo who's got all the tattoos, and suddenly as you're sleeping there on the ground with this hobo, his tattoos start coming alive. You know, what a, that's just an incredible introduction to a story. Sounds like an LSD trip though, doesn't it? Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think Bradbury was guilty of that, but yeah. yeah. No, 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 not, not that I have any experience with that. I'm just saying. <laughs> right. No, no, I got you. Tom. <laughs> All right. So what is it about Bradbury that you would spend fully, I guess, 20% of a 15 lecture course on Bradbury in particular? Why is he the towering figure? In large part, Tom, because he not only appeals to kids, if you pick him up today and, you know, if I picked him up in my late 40s right now, which I do, uh, there's still the man could just write and he could think. And one of the things that he does, so he always brings this optimism and this love of life, though he can be very dark, too. And I think that's part of his genius. But he appeals to so many different people. And I think it really is. And I know this could sound corny, but I think there is something about him that is an authentic American voice. I think there's something, I don't think a Europe, I don't think a Britain could have produced him. I think the fact that he's from small town, northern Illinois, and that he grew up in California, there's just something that you can see in that. Uh, it's there always. His love, for example, later of Ronald Reagan, uh, which also, of course, northern Illinois boy, uh, very similar lives uh, what they had when they were kids. I think there's just something very American about about him. But the reason I spend so much time on him in science fiction and in this course, not just because he's a libertarian, but you know, Heinlein's probably more of a libertarian, but I think that Bradbury in the long run is more interesting. And that's not, I love Heinlein, that's not a knock on Heinlein, but I think that Bradbury has more staying power. And one of the reasons that I do spend so much time on him, Tom, is simply because probably more than any other figure in the 20th century, even more than C.S. Lewis, Bradbury at the time gave legitimacy to science fiction as a genre. So once Bradbury started writing, it was everybody suddenly said, and it, it's right at the same time that the at, uh, Fahrenheit 451 came out, this is the same time the term science fiction actually became the term to describe that form of literature. So in large part, Bradbury was science fiction and science fiction was Bradbury. And even people, uh, the Atlantic, for example, which kind of held its nose up at science fiction now had to take it seriously because Bradbury was writing it and they couldn't dismiss him. So that that's why he's so important. You even find it later, I mean, weird stuff. So for example, and I talk a little bit about Star Trek in the story, when William Shatner was asked to be Captain Kirk, he had not been in science fiction shows other than The Twilight Zone. He was mostly a Shakespearean actor in Canada. And when he read an essay by Bradbury saying, no, science fiction is a completely legitimate form of expression, that's when Chatner agreed to be Captain Kirk. Now, I don't mean to suggest, okay, their life just changed dramatically, but it's a point, I think, that shows just how powerful Bradbury was as a figure. Right, no doubt. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. That's a real, that's a major, major thing that he can take yeah, credit I, for. Yeah, and of course, you know, we imagine how much we've become science fiction now. It's everywhere in everything, in every book. There's always some science fiction element, even in the most realistic novels. So it, it's a genre that's really been successful over the last 60 years. 
All right. I, th- there are going to be there are a couple of people whose names will be known to most listeners, but I want to jump over to Russell Kirk for a minute because sure. you did, after all, write an award winning book on Russell Kirk, and I didn't know until somebody handed me a book of his stories that he also had been a fiction writer. And I'm wondering what is significant about his work in this way. I mean, he's known as the great conservative thinker of the 20th century, but he writes fiction. And are we seeing any, I I don't want to reduce everything to political themes. Like I'm sick and tired of people who go to the movies and all they can say at the end was that was kind of a libertarian movie. Look, can you just (laughs) turn that part of your brain off for two hours? But still I kind of want to know what's, if there's anything going on beneath the surface. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, Russell Kirk, you know, very interesting, Tom. I, Kirk even joked about this in his autobiography, that he would always be the two Kirks. The Kirk who wrote science fiction and horror, and then the Kirk who wrote on conservatism. And I, it is amazing to me. I, I guess I was fortunate, having gotten to know Annette Kirk, his widow, during the 1990s, I came to his short stories pretty quickly when I found out, after I had read The Conservative Mind and others, but had not really thrown myself into Kirk, when I found out he had also written, uh, written fiction, of course, I just immediately gravitated towards the fiction. So in some ways, I encountered his fiction before a lot of his nonfiction works. And he is very good. I, I don't... One of the things I tried to argue in my own book on Kirk is that he has all of the instincts of Ray Bradbury without quite being at that level. Uh, But I do think that he is at a very high level. So if we put, say, Bradbury or Flannery O'Connor at an A-plus level, I think Kirk at his worst was probably around a B to a B-plus. And I think at his best, he was between an A-minus and an A. So when he wrote really, really well his fiction, it was excellent. But he could also, an interesting that you say, Tom, you get tired of people talking about politics and art. When Kirk started writing, a lot of his short stories were basically just kind of veiled allegories against the New Deal or against you know, something. And, you know, they're fine. And of course, I agree. Great. Let's, you know, let's knock down FDR where we can. But the art isn't quite there. And as he progresses, his politics remains, but it becomes much more artful. So rather than it just being in your face, it, it actually, it's part of the story. And I think there's a, a much greater depth to it. But you know, we recognize, we think about Kirk, we remember him as this conservative writer, but even someone like Stephen King has acknowledged that one collection of Kirk's short stories are probably uh, this one collection he wrote in the 1970s is probably one of the mo- hundred most important books, Stephen King says, of the second half of the 20th century. Wow, that is an amazing testimonial. It is. And and King has moved so far beyond any of that. Yeah, that was in his younger days when he was writing, who had influenced him. And King, of course, politically has become extremely left wing, though in his earlier work, he is very libertarian. Uh, and I'm not sure what happened there. And I haven't studied him well enough. But you can see that when you read King, King obviously follows a lot of the pattern that Kirk used. The difference between Kirk and King, Kirk might describe a rape scene, but what he'll do is he'll have a male gaze at a female, and then he'll have a break in the writing. And the next paragraph, the woman's waking up in a stunned daze. And you know exactly what happened, but he doesn't describe any of it. Whereas King, of course, will give you three or four pages of what that rape was like. That's really the difference. And I think it's a huge difference. But they're both writing in the same genre, just approaching it in very different ways. All right, let's pause to thank our sponsor for just a minute. Folks, I am here not just to inform, entertain, and inspire, but also to improve your lives in a vast array of ways. And one of them is to improve your sleep, your overall comfort, your attitude toward life, your joie de vivre, if I may say so. And one way to do that is by getting a great night's sleep on a Casper mattress. Casper mattresses are obsessively engineered. They give you supportive memory foams, for a sleep surface that's got just the right sink and just the right bounce. They've had over 20,000 reviews with an average of 4.8 stars. And you can get one for a great price with free shipping. And you have 100 nights to try it risk-free in your own home. 
Casper mattresses are designed, developed, and assembled in the USA, and you can get $50 toward your Casper mattress by going to casper.com slash woods and entering promo code woods at checkout. I'm telling you, you're going to thank me. Casper.com slash woods with promo code woods. All right, let's move on to a couple of names that will be familiar to a lot of listeners. Of course, Ayn Rand is quite familiar. Does she belong in the science fiction genre? Is it science fiction work that she's doing? Oh, absolutely, Tom. Uh, and it, but it's it's more than that too. Rand was very, very, <laughs> very wise about the way she marketed herself and the way that she put her own writings forward. So when you look at the Fountainhead, for example, there are a lot of science fiction themes, but the story itself is not science fiction. But the fact that you have this architect who's kind of a futurist and he's employing all these Frank Lloyd Wright styles, but beyond that, and of course has this total integrity. Uh, there's already a kind of dystopian. There's kind of a democratic dystopia in that, especially when Howard Rourke blows up his own building towards the end of the novel. Yeah, that, that's a really important dystopian moment, I think. It's far more blatant, obviously, in books like Anthem, which is just pure science fiction. And then later on in Atlas Shrugged. Atlas Shrugged is dystopian. And of course, that's a subgenre of science fiction, but there's so much in it from the weaponry to what's going on in society that really does have a strong science fiction element. So I, I think that Rand, part of her success, obviously she has a huge following, but I think part of her mainstream success was that she also, at the same time that Bradbury and Heinlein and Lewis, whom yeah, Rand hated, but they're all making science fiction palatable to a broader reading audience and Rand was very much a part of that movement, especially with Atlas Shrug coming out in 1957. With her books, you don't have to fish around saying, what philosophical points is she trying to convey to the reader? There's no mystery there, as there right. might be with if Ray Bradbury indeed even had that sort of ambition. Right. You might have to snoop around for it, but you don't exactly have to hire a private detective to figure out what Ayn Rand is up to. No. And that was one of the reasons that somebody like Bill Buckley felt that her work was simply without literary merit, because, if you re because it consists of these wooden characters making long philosophical speeches. And Look, I'll just come right out and say I enjoyed her fiction work, except I did not like Anthem. Everybody seems to like Anthem. I didn't like it at all. I liked her three larger books. So I'm not saying this as somebody who's a critic of, of Rand. I enjoyed her books. But when I saw those books translated onto the big screen, first, it's a, it's a problem of the actors weren't so good. But then I thought to myself, maybe the problem isn't entirely the actors. Maybe it's that they're having words put into their mouths that no real person would say. Maybe they would deliver these words as a speech, but nobody would say them in their workaday lives, and it made the whole thing seem fake and unbelievable. So what do you think about the literary merit of her work? Yeah, uh, you know, Tom, I'm actually fairly sympathetic to it. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of all of her philosophy. I'm just way too Catholic to buy into a lot of her arguments. But I actually, if you look, for example, so ignore the speeches for a moment, but if you look at the plot of Atlas Shrugged, it is stunning. Uh, just how things move from one point to another, how the whole thing unfolds. I think she is an absolute master when it comes to plotting a story. I think the same thing was true with The Fountainhead. I don't like her characters. Uh, I mean, some of them I like. I liked, you know, the pirate uh, in Atlas Shrugged. I thought uh, the pirate, I thought he was really great. And, you know, I liked uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his name right now, but the industrialist Reardon at the beginning. Uh, John Galt, I thought, was pretty wooden. But even if you forget that, yeah, it's the plot is amazing how she's laid it out. And I think a lot of that comes from her own Hollywood experience when she was doing script writing in Hollywood in the 1930s and especially dealing with mysteries. You know, mysteries have to be really, really well plotted. And of course, there's a lot in Atlas Shrugged that is a mystery. Uh, it's not so much of a mystery now because we all know who John Galt is. But you can imagine the first few times people were reading that and trying to figure it out what's going on. I think she does a great job of that. The other thing I would say, and this is quirky and I've been really, I've been really, and understandably, I've been attacked by followers of Ayn Rand for this, but I really think that what she's doing with those speeches is she's giving us a very medieval way of writing. 
Uh, that is, she's writing mythology, uh, ancient or medieval. And I think she's, if you look at what's happening with Atlas Shrugged, all of the good guys are for all intents and purposes, Norse gods. And they even go up to their mountain. They go up, you know, if we think about the classical mythology, they go up to Olympus and they watch the world destroy itself. And then they cut back down to fix it. I really think she's telling in Atlas Shrugged, as much as it is science fiction, it is absolutely a mythology. And I think that's what she's doing. These are gods giving speeches. They're delivering homilies from on high. And I think if you approach it that way, it becomes less boring or less wooden. Well, even though it's wooden, I I, I still like the speeches. You know, I, oh, the, what they say are generally good, right? Yeah. I, I mean, and in fact, um, I think if uh, see I, this one I haven't read for the new intellectual, but I think that's a collection of some of the speeches actually. Yeah, that, I think that's uh, right. That you can read them outside the yeah. the context of the fiction books. It's been a while since I've looked at it. But Francisco uh, D'Anconia's uh, speech on money that he gives on money, at a party right? is a tremendous speech. So I'm not saying the speeches are bad. I'm just saying they're not plausible. Right. <laughs> you know, people right. don't do that, and if they did. Could you you would run away even if they're good speeches you would think this guy is a ponderous annoying self-absorbed jerk even though he's yes. brilliant brilliance brilliance is not enough for me to want to hang around with somebody yeah so of these works now have you have you read all of her fiction have you also read we the living I have okay yeah. okay I've read everything over what's your favorite we the living um, isn't that funny yeah I've yeah. kind of felt that way too. I think in large, I mean, it, it's an autobiography, really, of life in Soviet Russia. And, you know, there are elements of it, again, as a Catholic, I don't like. But I also understand where Rand is coming from, and I can see a reaction against any form of religion uh, and the way that she absorbed that kind of anti-religious attitude. But regardless, yeah, I, I think We the Living is, is really a moving novel about real people who are caught in a real struggle. All right. I, as I say, even despite all the criticisms, I'm a, I'm a fan of hers. I like the books. I found them totally thrilling and absorbing, even though you're right. There are parts of it that I just roll my eyes at. Totally agreed. But there's a figure I have not read at all that everybody sort of assumes I must have read. And that's another person who figures in this course. And that's this Robert Heinlein. I know sure. almost nothing about except the titles of the books and, well, I know more now that I've listened to your course, let's say, but but uh, two weeks ago I knew nothing about. So why don't you say something? Because last time people were upset that he wasn't mentioned when we talked last time, but that was because your course didn't didn't go up to that point. Yeah, you know, and I could have, Tom, uh, because really when I stopped the first set of lectures, Heinlein had just started writing, so I could have. But I thought it would be better because he's so associated with the 60s to put him in there. Uh, Heinlein's a really interesting guy uh, in every way. Weirdo, eccentric, entrepreneur, a good guy, I think, overall, despite his many kind of quirks. But really an American individualist, much like Bradbury, but more hardcore. Bradbury always had this kind of optimistic view of the world. And I think Heinlein had a pretty dark view of humanity and of the world. They're really one of his famous early novels, which would have not won him any literary acclaim was a book called the puppet masters and it later it came out as a movie probably when you were in college tom and it's okay it's not the movie's not great but the story is pretty good it's a an anti-communist story you know what happens if we're taken over bodily by some foreign entity and clearly there it was communism but he heinlein's a mixed bag in the way that he writes only because, so he starts off with kind of juvenile, fun, action science fiction, and then he gets into much more philosophical science fiction. So the Puppet Masters is his first kind of good work, but it's not great. But then he writes Starship Troopers, and then Strangers in a Strange Land, and then Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And in each of those, now he himself would have been a very, very strong and everyday he would have been a very strong, straight down the line, kind of Goldwater libertarian. 
But in his writing, he liked playing around with different ideas. So in Starship Troopers, which has been made into an absolutely terrible movie, the novel is actually quite good. But in Starship, Tro Starship Troopers, he plays around with the idea of what if we in the future lived in a classical republic and he makes Argentina that republic. And then in Strangers in a Strange Land, he plays with the idea and it's all bad. What if we had a world government? And then in The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, that's his most Randian novel and it's very pro Ayn Rand. There you have a revolt, just like America's revolt in 1776, but it's a revolt on the moon. Uh, and that is the moon is revolting from the earth. But it's the same, it's essentially the same story with a lot of science fiction elements thrown in. That's his most libertarian novel, I think, by far. But all of them, you know, no matter what he's doing, he's always trying to play with forms of society and forms of government. And a really interesting guy. And I, I can see I can see why libertarians both kind of love him and distrust him only because they know personally he's a libertarian, but he doesn't always write as one. Huh, OK, now looking over this array of authors and this period of time, what do we walk away with if we're trying to say – there is something meaningful in what's being written here that should have a special meaning for libertarians. What would those things be? And is it different from any of the themes that you talked about in the earlier course? There, it's a continuation of those themes, Tom, and especially the idea that I think by its very nature, science fiction allows a true kind of individualism to come out. And therefore, a lot of people like Lewis, uh, like Heinlein or Bradbury or Rand, those who are not leftists, they found a niche there where they could write and be accepted. And their ideas, yeah, you know, like Fahrenheit 451 or Atlas Shrugged could be accepted as something that could be taken seriously. No other genre of literature really allowed that, even the mystery genre, which seemingly should have been able to allow that, was often dominated by Marxists. Uh, it was often used as a critique of capitalist society. Uh, and so in the mysteries, you can have some libertarians, but for whatever reason, a, a lot of a lot of leftists gravitated towards the mystery field and the film noir as well. And I, and I love all that, but it's definitely got a much more left-wing tinge than any science fiction ever did, which is also one of the reasons it took a while for science fiction to be accepted because it did take some of those ideas that were not leftist very seriously. But in the 1950s and 60s, one of the things I was trying to do with this set of lectures, Tom, was just to show, so it, it's definitely a part of a whole. So we're in the middle of the story here and we still have to complete the story. But in that middle of the story, we find that in times like the 1950s and 1960s, that not only had science fiction become legitimate, but in so many ways, because so many writers were libertarian, libertarianism became widespread as well in the 1950s and 60s. And you know, people who would pick up Rand, because they know it's a, a novel that's selling well, are reading it in part because it's science fiction, part because it's a best-selling novel. But as they're doing so, they're obviously absorbing a lot of libertarian ideas. And the same thing was true with Heinlein and with Bradbury, and even in Star Trek, uh, which was not, you know, Roddenberry, the founder of Star Trek, was by no means a libertarian. But even within that, there are a lot of libertarian themes that are being explored. So the point I was really trying to make with this set of lectures, Tom, again, middle of the story, is that it's no accident that we're going to find the rise of the Libertarian Party and of the Libertarian Movement in the 1970s very strongly and into the 1980s. And I don't want to say it's only because of science fiction, but I want science fiction to be a very important part of that story as well. Well, Brad, it's great material. Everybody's raving about it as usual. Oh, thanks, Tom. We're looking forward to what you produce next. It's a super I'm glad. I'm, I'm really glad to, that that's, that's the case. I'm supposed to be having... If we can just get the scheduling right, you know, Dave Weigel at the Washington Post has a book coming out on progressive rock. Did yeah, you know that? I, yes, I have a copy. Okay. Now, I'm supposed to – in fact, that's a good point. I got to – before I go on my trip tomorrow, I better run over to the post office and check the uh, post office box because he was supposed to send me one. Anyway, why am I thinking of this out loud right now? Anyway, I'm going to have him on soon, but I, I, I'm seeing – I've got – tickets to Ian Anderson later this year oh, with nice. a couple of the girls and I'm also uh, I, I'm, I've 
two tickets for the uh, two shows for the uh, the ARW version of Yes. Oh yeah. And, and one of them, I think I may have emailed you about this. I can't remember. Or maybe it was Dave I emailed about this. I got the VIP meet and greet package. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yep. Good. That's right. Yep. That's right. Good. He's, yeah. I mean, sometimes you got to just splurge. That's right. No, that's well worth it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They just, need, they just need to stay in good health between now and then. Right? We just yeah. cross our fingers and it's going to be great. Absolutely, Tom. Anyway, Absolutely. good. Good, good. All right. Anyway, we'll have to talk more uh, soon, but thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Tom. All right, everybody, allow me to take a minute to introduce you to a website created by a listener of this show, and it's called orthogonalideas.com. Now, how about that for a name of a website? Well, here's the idea behind it. In mathematics, two Euclidean vectors are said to be orthogonal if they are at right angles to one another. Speaking metaphorically, we can call two ideas orthogonal if they diverge from one another at right angles in idea space. Well, on this blog, he says, I will present ideas that are orthogonal to conventional wisdom. Idea space is multidimensional, and no matter how wrong the popular view may be, we would get nowhere sensible by simply reversing it. To be a smart contrarian, one must not only identify points where the consensus view is likely to be wrong, but also decide in which of many possible directions to depart from it. So in the uh, email that I got from the creator of this site, he says this way, I discuss ways of dissenting from popular wisdom without going off the deep end. I cover a wide range of topics, including economics, history, language, and philosophy, from a libertarian, anti-feminist, anti-egalitarian, pro-Western, and pro-civilization perspective. So check it out at orthogonalideas.com. I'm linking to it at tomwoods.com slash 925, as the listener website mentioned. Remember all the great bonuses you get if you use my link when you get your web hosting, including free publicity publicity to get you that first free burst of traffic. So find out how you can get these neat bonuses at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Meanwhile, remember, Brad's course is up at libertyclassroom.com. If this stuff interests you, you want to be a, a more well-rounded, informed, and better debating libertarian, then check out libertyclassroom.com. And I'll tell you, by the way, there's a secret coupon page at libertyclassroom.com slash coupons. So check that out, and I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>